right, welcome back. We are going to resume the rest of our program. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Claus to introduce our next session and our next speaker. Thank you so much, Emily. So we are very excited to have Dr. Douglas Fair. Um, you know, one of the things that lower grade glioma patients and younger patients with brain tumors struggle with are a number of issues, including fertility, family planning, uh, how treatment may interact with this, whether there are any issues in terms of outcomes with pregnancy. So Dr. Fair is gonna to talk to us a little bit about that. He's an associate professor and congratulations from the, the internet. I see you've gotten an upgrade in your position. Uh, the Division of Hematology Oncology. He's also the director of the Primary Children's Hospital Solid Tumor Program, as well as the medical director at Huntsman Cancer Institute. And that's a adult and young adolescent program. Uh, so he's located at the Huntsman Cancer uh, Institute in the University of Utah and is co-medical director of their Oncofertility Program. So very interested uh, to hear what Dr. Fair has to say, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, just a real privilege, and uh, the content's been uh, super interesting. And somebody who doesn't take care of uh, brain tumors, I've learned a lot. I take care of solid tumors, not in the brain and spine. Uh, sarcomas primarily, but other solid tumors. All right. Well, thank you again for everybody who's on and um, is interested in this topic. It's a topic I'm very um, passionate about, and oncofertility fertility is a really important issue to uh, patients, survivors, um, and and patients who still have cancer. So again, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to, to talk a little bit about this today. I have no financial disclosures Perfect. And this is the uh, learning objectives or the agenda is to just to recognize how a brain tumor diagnosis, specifically low-grade glioma and treatments can impact fertility and family planning, to identify strategies available to help preserve fertility, to learn about techniques and options for family uh, planning uh, before, uh, after a diagnosis, while, um, while maybe still uh, undergoing treatment or planning for things after treatment finishes, and understand the costs associated with these techniques and resources. And uh, I'm very sad that I have to talk about this, but it's a it's a real important uh, reality um, in, in fertility. And then um, talking about how to navigate or self-advocate. And again, I wish that was not um, having to be a bullet or something to discuss, but it really is, unfortunately. And, and I'll discuss why. Um, <clears throat> I have a pictorial here, which is kind of uh, very generally kind of talks about what it is like to um, the sort of treatment plan um, for patients, uh, whether they are pediatric or AYA with, with cancer and how they go through. And again, just to define some terms, pediatric uh, cancer, sometimes defined as less than 15, um, sometimes defined as, as less than 18. AYA, um, which has been mentioned just a couple of times, but just want to define that term so people all know that. Um, it stands for adolescents and young adults with cancer. And so in the United States, the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, defines AYA cancer as anyone diagnosed with cancer between the ages of 15 to 39, um, quite a, a, a broad range. But we know that there's a host of issues, fertility being one of those, that's just really important for this, for this age. Um, and of course, fertility concerns can be in their in their 40s, but just wanted to define that. Um, and I also just want to give you some baseline, you know, numbers. Um, as we know, there's around 3,000 new uh, gliomas diagnosed every year. Um, but just to know that that is one small piece of the AYA population that is being diagnosed every year. Um, 120,000 are being diagnosed every year, or 80,000 between the ages of 8, 15 to 39. So you're not alone. Um, in the brain cancer community or in the AYA cancer community. A lot of patients, and still, as we've talked a lot about, we have some new uh, molecules, some new targeted therapies, but still um, cut, poison, and burn are still the three modalities we use to treat most cancers in, in, in brain cancers. And so they come with, um, while we have uh, keep improving survival, there are still a lot of toxicities that come and we're going to talk a little bit more about the fertility. And this is just the same schematic, but just emphasizing with like red arrows. Listen, you're diagnosed with cancer. It should be a discussion right at right up front, right when you were diagnosed um, and discussing what the treatment plans are. Fertility should happen then. Fertility discussion should happen then. But 
um, for those who haven't, um, whether you're still on therapy or whether you finish therapy and into survivorship, there are opportunities and things that we need to consider uh, after that. So um, it should be discussed early and often. Um, I just wanted to mention um, on the right is just a picture of uh, Salika Jawad, who is an AYA cancer survivor, and and she has a lot to say on um, what it is to be an AYA cancer patient and a survivor, and and she's talked a lot about her her journey. And in this book, uh, Between Two Kingdoms, um, in the first chapter, she talks about how while she's being treated at one of the best cancer centers in the country for her AML, um, they did not discuss. Uh, fertility preservation and how that was just really a breach of trust for her. So um, uh, is just to say that this is really an important issue for all patients. All right. So this um, pretty mundane looking uh, chart here, I just wanted to sort of um, give you a sense of how we think about um, the risk of infertility. So, you know, the first thing to think about is, uh, is this patient at um, risk for infertility. And for some patients with cancer, um, they just aren't. Um, and But for some, there are. And then we generally categorize them as kind of low, medium, or high. So on, on the top uh, on the top row there, you can see minimally increased risk, significantly increased risk, high level of, of risk. Um, and on the left, you can see the different factors that would, would correlate with that. And then there's a female, and I'll show you briefly a male. They're very similar. But this is from um, a standard accepted way of uh, risk assessment. Um, and on the left, the alkylators. So alkylators are a family of medicine. Temozolomide is, is one of those, um, as is uh, procarbazine or decarbazine. And um, these are medicines that are often used or talked about in consideration and treatment for gliomas. And so, as we know, um, as the aphorism goes, the poison is in the dose. So depending on how much a total dose of a certain medicine that might affect how we think about your risk for infertility. Um, they also have, as you see, heavy metals. So those platins, which sometimes are used um, in treatments of low-grade gliomas. Um, a stem cell transplant is not typically used, as you know, a lot. But then um, on the bottom left, there's radiation exposure. So um, there's actually two places. Now, we won't talk a lot about radiation exposure to the ovaries or testes because um, in brain cancer, that's not um, where radiation is directed. That is for some other cancers. But something to keep in mind is, as you see there, the term hypothalamus. So that is a part of the brain. The hypothalamus talks to the pituitary that then talks to the ovaries or the testes. And so we call that the HPA axis. And so those structures, if they, um, if surgery, um, surgeons very carefully try to avoid that area because it's very small and very delicate and very important, um, but they can um, get radiation exposure. And again, as you said, the, the poison's in the dose. So asking your team to consider where that radiation and how much the hypothalamus might be affected because um, that can affect how uh, your ovaries or testes are communicated with. This is very, this is uh, um, the for the males, very similar, um, not much difference there. Um, so won't belabor it, but those are kind of some of the factors we think about with fertility. All right, so this is a super busy slide with all of these words that are difficult to pronounce. I'm not going to go through them. And I really just wanted to, to bring up the fact that, um, as you've heard in some of the you know great talks earlier, um, targeted therapies, um, different molecules, immunotherapies are becoming a much bigger part of cancer therapy writ large and including low-grade gliomas, um, low-grade glioma therapy. What I would say is um, we don't know a lot about the gonadotoxicity of these agents, except to say that we think that in general, they are less gonadotoxic than say some of the other therapies we've talked about. The alkylators, radiation exposure to a certain area like part of the brain. So the um, important thing to note is we don't really know how gonadotoxic, but we think a lot less than our standard cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, and so I think one of the things to, to talk about with your oncologist is with these medicines, ask them, what is the latest known? Is there much to think about as far as uh, risk for infertility with these different agents? And then this is looking at, you know, a couple of common paradigm treatment paradigms for low-grade gliomas, uh, PCV. Um, you know, this, this 
this regimen as it's classically given is very gonadotoxic. Um, so, you know, really can affect the ability of the ovaries or the testes to um, produce eggs or sperm afterwards. So if this is part of your treatment plan, it is a really important thing to consider if family building um, in the classic sense is something that's um, important to you to talk about that beforehand, before you start therapy. Temozolamide, um, as I talked about, very commonly used in low-grade gliomas. Um, it is gonadotoxic, certainly less than uh, PCV, um, but there are a lot of um, documented live births after being on temozolamide. And so it is certainly a, um, a thing where we expect um, that it will affect fertility, um, but it often still allows people to try to have um, children afterwards, but something certainly to consider and talk about with your oncologist. <laughs> um, excuse me. I have a graph I wanted to show you, um, and this is looking at ovarian um, injury. Um, it can be a little similar in testes, but I think I want to show you this graph to kind of demonstrate the point or how we might think about um, oncofertility or someone's risk for infertility. So on the left, it says number of follicles or eggs in an ovary. And so in general, and then on the bottom, you can see age. So age 10, 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old. The line that you can see sloping down is like the number of eggs. And the dotted lines in between the dotted lines, the first dotted line up top is when you would um, when you would start uh, puberty. So when a female would um, start ovulating or start um, with their menses, and that is when they first can become pregnant. So then the bottom dotted line is when, in this case, is demonstrating um, menopause or not being able to to conceive any further. And then so we say in between that area is our reproductive window. And so I wanna show you how chemotherapy can affect that kind of pictorially or graphically. So in this case, I'm showing the arrow says, you know, chemo at the age of 19. But again, if the, you got your chemo at the age of 33, 35, 32, 25, then you could kind of imagine where that would be a little bit different. So see, the, the, it does kind of two things This chemotherapy is how it's going to toxic. One is it literally just kind of drops the graph where it can damage follicles. And so there's just as less follicles, just less fertility. The other thing that's important to note is the slope of the line. So even afterwards, after the ovaries might or testes might take that hit, then the, the decline in the number of follicles that are still left become steeper or there's even less of a reproductive window. So that's why it's important to think about um, family building. If you've gone through therapy and well, I still have my menses, I, my periods have become normal. That is, and that's great. That might uh, have an opportunity for children later on, but it might mean that you're not going to have the same reproductive window, which is the average female might have, which is, you know, up until the early forties, mid forties, um, or late thirties. So that's another thing to kind of think about. Okay. So I'm going to quickly run through the, um, available strategies for fertility preservation for females and males, um, and try not to get too bogged down in, into the, the science and the techniques, but give you an overview of, of these concepts. So embryo cryopreservation, cryopreservation, when I say that, that is the fancy term for freezing, um, the tissue or freezing it. So then you can, um, use it later. So embryo cryopreservation is essentially oocyte or egg cryopreservation, but using that combining with a sperm. So if you have a partner um, uh, that you'd like to combine a sperm with, um, then you can, instead of freezing just the egg, freeze the embryo. They're about the same rate of, uh, of freezing, thawing, and being successful. Embryos historically have been just a little bit more successful, um, uh, but, but uh, oocyte or eggs are almost quite there. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation. So this is a really important um, advance that we have um, really gotten a lot better at in the last couple of decades. So this is for patients who are either prepubescent, so that's really for, for children who are going to experience a high rate of um, gonadotoxicity, or for women who their oncologists say, you know, we don't have two and a half weeks, which is the time that you need for an egg or embryo cryopreservation. And so what this can do is you can have um, a procedure, a surgery, where um, a surgeon will take a little bit of um, ovarian tissue and then freeze that, and then use that later on to create the eggs to then hopefully create a live birth. Um, the downside there is that is a lot less successful than either the egg 
or the embryo cryopreservation. So that's why it's definitely a second um, second best choice. Ovarian transposition is the, our fancy term for moving the ovaries out of the radiation field, not um, really applicable to this population. And unfortunately, we can't move the hypothalamus out of the way of radiation. Um, the GRH agonist, so Lupron is, the, is um, one of the common uh, medicines and um, these medicines can um, offer some benefits for, for females um, if they're going to be getting um, some medicines that can lower platelet count or getting some standard cytotoxics. We just really want to differentiate. And maybe there's a little bit of benefit of sort of these medicines kind of put the ovary to sleep while going through chemotherapy. There may be some benefit for fertility, but it, if there is, it's slight. And so we just don't want to conflate that as I am undergoing fertility preservation. And sometimes the way it's presented to patients, I think can be a little confusing. So we just want to make sure we're clear on that. Here are just some pictures of kind of talking about what I'm, what I'm, um, what I, what we were kind of talking about with the bullets. Um, so this is talking about our egg cryopreservation. And so what, this is about a two and a half week process. And there's sort of two parts. One is the collection of tissue. Um, the collection of tissue is done um, through a needle um, that goes in the pelvis through the vagina under sedation. And I'll show a picture of that in just a second. But the first part of that is actually the stimulation. And that takes about two weeks. Unfortunately, these medicines, these hormones that you have to get, um, I wish they could be by pill, but they are injections. So it's sort of daily injections for about two, two and a half weeks. And what that does is it tells the ovary like, hey, instead of getting one egg ready, which is what happens during normal menses, we're going to have a procedure that goes in and gets them. Why don't we get as many eggs ready as possible? So on the right there, you can kind of see where they see natural cycle. That's one follicle maturing into an oocyte or an egg. Um, below that is where they... Um, where you would have gotten a lot of hormones to stimulate a lot of eggs. And then the bottom is an ultrasound looking at all of those um, sort of matured follicles that they're going to go and then extract. And then this is a picture of, um, you know, sort of extracting those eggs. And so um, as you can see on the right, um, under sedation, uh, a needle is passed through the vaginal wall using an ultrasound, looking at those um, those follicles, matured eggs, and then going and retracting or taking those out. And then um, they are either slow freeze or put into a special solution and then put into a special freezer cryopres cryopreservation. <laughs> this is a pictorial looking at the difference between on the right, um, either uh, an oocyte cryopreservation or egg that we kind of already talked about or ovarian tissue. And I won't go through all the steps, um, but just know that this is something that is um, that is really should be considered for patients who do not have the time, the two and a half weeks or three weeks and are going through something that is going to be very gonadotoxic. So if that is the case, if that's part of your treatment plan, it's something to, it's something to consider and, um, and should be offered. Okay. For men, um, it's, more simple and straightforward. For most men, we're talking about just sperm banking, which is essentially masturbating into a sterile cup. Um, it's done in an andrology clinic and typically we try to do it ideally uh, three to four times to get a good sample. Um, it's a lot cheaper, way more straightforward. Um, and that's really the the um, the thing that we offer for mo or encourage for most men. Um, for men who cannot um, obtain an erection, sometimes if there are tumors that are affecting the nerves that innervate um, the penis, there are other uh, techniques. Um, a few of them are called like TESI procedures. And this is where um, under sedation um, or light anesthesia, um, actually a needle goes into the, the testy and actually extracts some sperm there. It doesn't extract as much sperm um, or necessarily the quality of sperm or sperm banking. And again, it's a, um, it's, um, it's a surgery procedure and sperm banking is definitely the preferred um, method if we, can, if we can do that. All right, so again, one of my least favorite things to talk about when I'm counseling a patient in, uh, about um, fertility, and there's a lot of awkward parts about it or sometimes difficult things to talk about, but my least favorite thing is definitely the cost because it's so unfair, it's so unfair. You're sitting in front of a patient who's diagnosed with cancer, talking about fertility, having to make some very difficult decisions, um, talking about things that are not fun, injections, procedures. And then we also have to bring up the fact that most insurance companies do not cover fertility preservation and certainly fertility preservation for cancer patients. I'll talk about how the movement is afoot to change this. And that's super exciting. And, and, um, and I've been a part of um, some efforts there nationally and, and in the state of Utah. But um, 
the truth is for most patients right now, 2023, it is not free. And so this is also where there's some inequity between females and males. Um, so as you can see, some estimated costs there I put up top. And the first part is, is for females, the UU site or egg cryopreservation, embryo, ovarian tissue cryopreservation. And this will vary at different institutions, um, but that's the, court, the cost. We're talking thousands of dollars for females. Towards the bottom, you see sperm banking for males, um, just a lot cheaper and a lot simpler. There are different programs out there, as you see in the very bottom of the asterisk. Um, you know, estimated costs do not include grants from Live Strong, Walgreens Harping Program, Reunite, and there's a few others that can help. Can there's specifically for cancer patients and fertility preservation, and that's one of the advantages of getting um, a fertility preservation consult from a. Um, a cancer center or that works with an REI group, a reproductive endocrinology and infertility, those are female infertility doctors or male infertility doctors, they will likely know about these and can help the patient get enrolled in these to really defray the cost. For the females, we can sometimes get them down half of the cost, um, a quarter of the cost um, with, the, with these programs. So they're super important to consider. Just did want to mention that um, the movement is afoot, as I said, to um, increase insurance coverage. Um, so um, this is uh, a map of where there's been legislation being put in laws that state that insurance companies um, have to start covering fertility preservation um, for, for cancer patients. So um, it's something that, um, again, the movement is afoot, but um, it should have happened uh, yesterday, and it's still going to be, I think, many years um, before we have 100% fertility preservation coverage for cancer patients, unfortunately. All right, some guideline statements from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network or the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Um, I just, I'm just going to read them to you. Fertility preservation as well as sexual health and function should be an essential part of the management of AYAs with cancer. The ASCO statement is all newly diagnosed cancer patients of childbearing age must be informed about potential loss of fertility and receive referrals to infertility specialists. So, you know, my bolded statement at the bottom here, discussing potential infertility and infertility preservation options is the standard of care. And I'm and I show you the slide, not that you guys care what the guideline statements are, but to empower you guys to know this is our responsibility. Our responsibility is oncologists, neurosurgeons. Um, your cancer team is to, yes, goals one through 10 is to cure your cancer, to give you the best cancer treatment, to um, to give you the longest survival possible, all of those things. It is also important that we counsel and give you options to help um, mitigate all of the side effects and in including fertility. So you are not asking um, something that is is not expected of us. I really like this quote from um, Dr. Nieder Huber, who is the director of the National Cancer Institute. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to explain how it, it pertains here, but he said access to health care will be a greater barrier, a greater determinant of cancer mortality than scientific advances. And I would just say that, like, we're not this talk that I'm giving is is not about um, increasing, uh, decreasing mortality or increasing cures, but it is talking about access and access to a quality conversation about and giving patients options that are out there is something that is so important. And we sometimes forget, we do get excited about the incredible advances we make with uh, molecular technology, with gene science, with better treatments. And those are super important. We also need to talk about, do we have access to um, treatments that are out there? In this case, oncofertility treatments. Um, Okay, so uh, just a few uh, statements that we can make from the from the data. Do patients want to discuss fertility preservation? Yes, fertility preservation in so in so many surveys and in good research has shown to be the primary, if not a primary, concern for survivors or patients with cancer in that AOA age range. Um, survivors wish to have biologically related children. They actually place an increased value on parenthood as a result of their cancer experience. <laughs> to me, achieving parenthood after cancer therapy can restore a sense of normalcy and a loss of fertility can be as difficult to face as cancer itself. And that is for, um, for some AYAs with cancer. And, and that's a reality. And this is why this is just really important issue to, to talk about. 
The next obvious question is, are we, are oncologists or on cancer teams discussing fertility preservation? And the resounding answer is, is not enough and not well enough. Um, while healthcare providers have increasingly recognized the importance of fertility preservation and things are a lot better than they used to be, they are, um, the communication around infertility risk and assessment is definitely suboptimal and up to patients, and this is in a recent report, up to half patients re report inadequate um, information and unmet information needs uh, around um around uh, uncle fertility. And there really is an increased bias, and I'm happy to talk about this in the Q&A, towards brain tumor patients and, and where oncology or cancer teams think, well, you know, th this might not be as an important issue, or they still have some of their tumor left in, this can't be that important. And that's just not the truth. Um, I, I recently um, was... Uh, was I wrote a piece in the elephants and tea and for those AYAs with cancer I just can't say enough about this um, periodical um, this free publication that is really um, geared towards the patient experience it's incredible but um, there's a lot of great stories they did one that's just about fertility uncle fertility and I wrote a piece about why are we as the cancer community as oncologists um, as cancer teams not having the conversation enough um, so feel free to to, to read into that. Um, I wanted to talk for the last couple of minutes just about um, low-grade gliomas and, and, and pregnancy. Here is a really important statement. Will pregnancy negatively impact patient survival? The answer is we do not think so at this time. We have the best study that has been done that looked at a lot of patients, um, I think it was Finland or Norway, um, they looked at low-grade glioma patients and then um, and pregnancy, and they did not see a change in overall survival. So I can't emphasize that enough. So we do not think, we do not have any evidence to say that you will have a shorter lifespan if you become pregnant. And I'm happy to talk more about that because there's a lot of nuance to this because this gets to the second question. Will pregnancy put me at risk for having a change in imaging or tumor behavior, tumor growth and, and, and de-differentiation, worsening scans, that sort of thing? This is where we really need to talk about this. There is some evidence to say that higher grade gliomas, more aggressively acting tumors, that maybe there's some hormonally driven part of that, maybe. That is not everyone, and it really sort of depends. And I'd also say that we really have to think about what is progression because sometimes patients see um, a change in scan. Well, when patients are, um, are pregnant, there's a lot of just general swelling or edema, including in parts of the brain. So sometimes you see um, these studies are sort of flawed and that they can sometimes see progression. That doesn't mean the tumor is actually act, acting more aggressively or that the pregnancy had anything to do with that. So I really have to say that um, when you talk to your neuro-oncologist, when you talk to your surgeon, what am I at risk for um, infertility? And do, do, you, do we have any other data to say that pregnancy is going to um, shorten my lifespan or make my cancer worse? And the answer that we have right now for low-grade gliomas is no, we don't have, we don't have evidence of that. But it's a, but it's a, it's a nuanced thing, and, and as more evidence comes up, and as more of the low-grade gliomas, as we heard in this talk, their low-grade gliomas are, are becoming um, differentiated by molecular characteristics, and how that plays in will be something that we will um, be looking at, but it will be data that will come down in years to decades. Should I get additional monitoring while I'm pregnant? And the answer there is yes. Um, the recommendations are to get um, MRIs um, uh, or CTs more frequently during um, your pregnancy to just look for any change, um, just to make sure that we stay on top of that, um, especially if you have active symptoms. If you have a seizure disorder, epilepsy due to your um, due to your cancer, definitely these are things that can slightly change during your pregnancy. Does that mean your cancer is necessarily getting worse? No, it could be just um, pregnancy induced um, edema that is uh, possibly uh, worsening symptoms. And but that is to say that when, if you have a low grade glioma and you get pregnant. I can't emphasize enough to go to um, a cancer center and a pregnancy center that is um, that is nuanced and that is um, used to dealing with the nuance of cancer and pregnancy together because um, the conversation around anticonvulsants or seizure medicines is a very 
um, nuanced one and one that um, needs to be discussed with your neurologist and your cancer doctor, but this should not keep you from having that conversation or considering uh, family building if that is important to you. All right, and I think just my last um, really slides are things that I um, really already talked about with how can I advocate for myself? And these are some questions that I really would encourage you, regardless of your cancer diagnosis, but um, and, but certainly if you have a low-grade glioma or had a low-grade glioma or just recently diagnosed with low-grade glioma, to make sure that you get the care that you need. What is my risk of progression? Um, and asking for the, the latest data there, if there is any change in survival. And right now I can tell you the data does not say that pregnancy decreases uh, life expectancy for patients with low-grade glioma. What is my risk for infertility? As I said, depending on your, your therapy, that really changes. Medicines, radiation, radiation field. What are my fertility preservation options? We went over some of those. And how much time do I have before I start therapy? Again, if you're doing egg harvest, um, you'll need two and a half, three weeks, that sort of thing. And so talking with your surgeon and your oncologist about that. And then what are things that I can do if I can't do fertility preservation before therapy? There are a lot of things to consider after um, you've done with your, your the medical therapy. And then can I see an expert in fertility? And they should already be kind of referring you to this if they can't answer these questions for you, but um, please feel free to ask for that. And then also talking about the financial piece, which um, hopefully the fertility clinic that you referred to is um, is understanding of that and can help, and help you work through that. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for the time. It's an honor to, to talk to this to this group of patients and um, and colleagues and experts, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Fair, for your presentation. Just as a reminder, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please type and submit it using the Q&A button, and we will answer as many questions as time allows. So one of the first questions we have here uh, goes back to the costs of treatment. And I know you uh, touched on some of the resources available, and we will include those in our resource handout post-event. But can you quickly just touch on some resources that are available for patients uh, in terms of financial support? Yeah. Um, so Live Strong has a, a program. This is the one that Lance Armstrong famously founded, and, and now he's not associated with it anymore. But um, they um, they have a program that they contract with a, a fertility clinic to say, you will give a decrease, you will charge less if uh, for fertility preservation for cancer patients. Um, so that's something that like you, if you make sure you go to a clinic that has an association with Livestrong, and then there's a form that you fill out. But um, that's the same thing with uh, Reunite program, which helps defray the cost of the, of the prescriptions, which can be very expensive for women. It's about half of that cost, half of that 10,000, 12,000, 8,000. I was talking about half of it is medicines, half of it is the procedure and ultrasounds. And then Walgreens, um, has an incredible program like Reunite that um, really um, helps cover the cost. They have some um, inclusion or exclusion criteria based on um, income, that sort of thing. But I think the most important, it, it's actually a good screener, is that um, if you go to a fertility clinic, asking them if they are aware of these programs, that they associate with them, and then they should be able to help you walk through the, the paperwork. It's pretty straightforward. Thank you so much. And I do want to highlight what one of our attendees mentioned too, to make sure that you ask your hospital or your clinic if they have any financial programs or grant programs as well. Thank you so much to our attendee that mentioned that. That's great advice. Another question we have here is, if you can touch on the role of stress on fertility, can stress impact a patient's fertility? Because we know as patients, that's already very stressful. Can that impact their fertility levels as well? Um, before I opine, just a disclaimer, I'm not an infertility doctor, so I'm not like a reproductive endocrinology, infertility, or a urologist or andrologist, but I'm, I'm an oncologist. Um, but what I would say is absolutely, um, uh, fertility is sort of still, um, it's just a very interesting field and there's so much that goes into actually getting pregnant. Um, and what I would just say is one of the things I would um, just really encourage is have the conversation, have the conversation, have the conversation. And if that's with like when you're first being diagnosed, asking your oncologist, but then getting a referral to talk about um, with a fertility um, specialist. I just haven't had one patient personally um, 
and that has not benefited or felt like having a conversation, even if they weren't totally sure about their risk and about um, if if building a family in that way is something for them. I just haven't had a patient or a couple that have not benefited from that conversation. And they can answer sort of questions like this. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's where I would, how I'd kind of answer that question. Thank you so much for that insight and advice. Another question we have here is asking, what steps should someone take to determine when is the right time to get pregnant naturally after completing treatments? Yeah, um, a very personal, or I said, I feel like I've said nuance like 30 times, so I apologize, but I, I would I would use that term uh, again. I'll say from the medicine standpoint, if you were to ask me like, when do we usually um, ask patients to be off of chemotherapy or medicines, we usually say three months, six months is ideal. And the reason being is that the medicines are totally out of your system. And, um, and we, we don't think there's any going to be risk for, um, complications or abnormal, um, eggs or embryos doing to be on therapy. So that is why we say when on therapy, when getting medicines, we really discourage, we want you to use birth control and do not, um, get pregnant because, um, it's a stress in the body and and the embryo can be um, significantly altered. So we usually say three months, six months, but there's evidence of people being off temozolomide and and healthy pregnancies within like three weeks. I wouldn't recommend it. And um, and we that's what we generally say. Now, as far as when in the whole my low grade glioma treatment plan, I'm done with medicines and when is a good time or a safe time or um, how does this go with like, how long do I want like consistent scans? And that is really a personal, not only a personal choice, but one that should be discussed with your oncologist. And again, I have just found that like oncologists are so welcome to talk about this, but sometimes they're not, they don't know how to talk. They don't know to bring it up. They don't bring it up like well enough. And that's where sadly, I think having some self um, advocacy is super important. Um, and just being able to have that dialogue. Thank you so much for sharing that. Another question we have here is asking if a patient were to decide to, to wait to undergo fertility preservation until after treatment, is there any negative impact of doing that? Are the sperm or the oocytes negatively impacted from treatment? Would they be lower quality if they waited? That's a really great question. We do not think, so again, assuming we're talking about one uh, a patient that is going to get um, medical therapy as part of their treatment plan and the surgery alone, no. Um, but if they're getting medicines, temozolomide, other cytotoxic agents or something newer, we don't think it affects the quality, meaning that there's increased risk of, of birth defects or miscarriages. We, we don't see that. Um, but as I showed with that sort of graph, um, depending on the medicines you get, could there be less eggs, less follicles, um, and less, and therefore less chance of getting pregnant. Yes. So, um, depending on your therapy, it could affect your chance of getting pregnant, but if you were to get pregnant again, off of therapy, so please do not, um, get pregnant on therapies, but if you give some time off of therapies, we don't think that there's an increased risk of, uh, birth defects or, um, or abnormalities with the embryo or, um, fetus. And then with, with the birth. Thank you so much. Another question we have here is asking about patients who are on wait and watch. So they haven't undergone chemo or radiation yet. Would you suggest undergoing fertility preservation at that time? Fertility preservation, besides the cost, the, you know, the whole, the whole process, the injections and the procedures, but I don't want to minimize. Um, but Besides those, I, I there's not a real downside for the fertility preservation. So I mean, it's a totally personal choice, and if family building is not something you're interested in, or then of course not. But um, if you are the fertility preservation piece, I, I just don't see a real downside, or certainly a downside of having the initial conversation to get again a discussion with a fertility doctor to talk exactly how this process would work for you. But um, I see no problem with that. And as far as the question about just getting pregnant. Um, again, I think that's just a very personal choice and with, you know, themselves, their partner and, but then also bringing that conversation in with their, um, with their oncologists and their cancer team. And I would just say, 
if the cancer team is, you feel like that's not something that they are interested in talking about or can't like refer you to the right people, that might be a good sign that there's maybe something wrong with your cancer team. I haven't heard of um, really great cancer teams who they might not be the best at bringing it up and they might not know a lot about fertility stuff, but to be able to talk about what do we think that pregnancy and how my cancer is going to do if I get pregnant, is, is this going to cause a problem or talk about that conversation of timing? I, I think oncologists are very welcome to have that conversation. Um, so please, please bring that up. Thank you so much. Another question we have here is asking for someone who does undergo um, fertility preservation in terms of having eggs frozen, does that reduce their ovarian reserve? No, not significantly. We think like these eggs are in the in the many, many thousands. And so when you do an egg, um, when you do an egg harvest, um, you know, you could get anywhere between four, eight, 12, in their 20s, 22 eggs, um, you know, in a really good collection. So no, you're not really um, decreasing your, your risk of, uh, or your follicular reserve by doing egg cryopreservation, but it's a good question. Great, thank you so much. Uh, another question we have goes back to what you mentioned about the bias that you've noticed uh, towards bringing up fertility with brain tumor patients. Can you talk about that a little bit more and uh, thinking about the role a patient can play in addressing this bias and ensuring that they are advocating for themselves? Yeah, it's. I, I'm glad the question came up and we have a little bit of time just to linger on a little bit more. And, and this is also why I was just uh, so honored, but just excited to hear about the American Brain Tumor Association bringing, you know, having a, a speaker like myself about talk about this topic, because I think particularly with brain, I think um, patients who um, who live with disease or they you know, still have um, some of their residual tumor or cancer, patients with a poor prognosis or patients where we don't know what their um, their cure might be, and we might have many years to decades to live, but we we don't know if there ever will be a cure. There's a huge bias, um, and it, it doesn't it's it's not intentional, but there's a huge bias, and the literature bears this out. And I and patients have talked to me about this, and I have seen it um, sometimes in colleagues where because if they fit in those categories, poor prognosis, they're um, they're not going to be cured, and or they still have residual disease. Patients, um, oncologists sometimes think, well, things like family building that can't be something that we should think about or that they want to think about, and that is just not true. Um, and so it has just been a resounding response from patients with cancer, whether they have just a poor prognosis up front. Um, they still want to talk about fertility preservation. Patients who still have um, active disease that may be um, dormant or just active disease, they still want to have the conversation. And patients who might never be cured, but have years to decades, they still want to have the conversation and they and they still very well might want to build their family. Um, so I just want to, unfortunately, it's a bias. And this is where extra self-advocacy is really important and where advocacy, where like the American Brain Tumor Association and, and other groups can really, um, I think, help pull the levers to, um, increase access and increase the ability to have conversations and get the word out there that yes, brain tumor patients want to have conversations about their future. And that very well could include um, fertility. Thank you so much for answering that. I think we have time for one more question. And this one goes back to the movement you talked about, about trying to increase insurance coverage for fertility treatments for patients. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the role that a patient can play in advocating for that movement? Yeah, um, I, um, I, I sit on the, on, the, on the board of the um, Alliance for Fertility Preservation, which is a really great organization. And um, so that, that organization helps um, with a lot of different movements that are going around nationally. I've learned so much about insurance coverage through this process. I, um, and I would say that it is just even more complicated than I thought. And it's not just some blanket statement that says the federal government can just say, you have to cover this. That would make some insurers have to cover it. Each state has to go through and they have to say, your insurers have to cover it. Then they have Medicaid has to do their own thing. So what I'd say is, um, but there are movements. So there's a lot of levers to pull to make this happen. But um, patient advocacy is just so important. Um, and so looking at the Alliance for Fertility Preservation, you can Google it um, or it's on my slides. 
um, reaching out to them or talking to your oncologist and say, hey, do you have an oncofertility fertility program? And then asking, just reaching out and dropping an email and saying, hey, I'm a cancer survivor, I'm a cancer patient, and this is an important issue to me and I'd like to increase access because it is the cost, especially for women, is a huge, huge barrier and it just shouldn't be and it's really unfair. And again, we're making we're making the move there, but um, like a lot of things in cancer, um, we'd like it to move a lot a lot more quickly, but patience, voice, and advocacy is um, is a huge part of it. So thank you for the question, and definitely there is. Thank you so much, Dr. Fair. That is all the time that we have for questions for this session. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to Emily for the rest of the program. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Fair, for giving us insight into you know how to build a family or continue a family after brain tumor diagnosis. This is such an important topic for our audience members. So thank you so much for being so eloquent and sharing with us today.